Good morning or good evening, everybody, uh, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, and um, my name is Holly Joseph, and I am the director of the um, Centre for Literacy and Multilingualism at the University of Reading. And I'm really pleased to welcome you to today's um, talk. So um, I'm sure many of you have attended previous SELM events and already know um, something about what we do. But for those of you who aren't familiar with SELM, um, I'll just say a few words about who we are and, and what we do. So our mission is to work in the field of literacy and multilingualism, to conduct research, engage with practitioners and the general public, and train the next generation of researchers. Our research spans five interconnected themes, and those themes are language and literacy, migration, health, education, and neuroscience. And tonight's talk is within the theme of health, but also has clear um, connections to some of our other themes. Um, so um, today's speaker is um, Sam Siabalapitia um, from um, Griffith University in um, Australia. And that's why we have the talk uh, at um, uh, nine o'clock in the morning UK time so that we can um, accommodate uh, um, Sam, of course, <laughs> and um, um, the audience from um, all over the world, but particularly in, in Australia. Um, so in a moment, I will um, hand you over to Vishnu Naya, who, um, who invited Sam and who um, is hosting today's talk. I also have to rush off um, um, as soon as I've done this um, introduction. Um, so I'm very sorry to miss the talk. Um, and so just a couple of words about um, how it will run. So this is a webinar, um, which means that your microphones are muted and your cameras are off. Um, but we do want to encourage questions and discussions. So feel free to post um, um, any comments um, in the chat section. And if you have questions, please make sure you post these in the Q&A section, not in the chat. Um, and we will address, we will ask those questions to um, Sam um, at the end. Please note as well that tonight's event is being recorded. Um, um, and I think that's all I need to say. So I will pass you over to Vishnu to introduce our speaker. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, and it's uh, a warm welcome to everybody. So it's good morning in in the UK and it's probably evening in the in the in Australia. So I'm really happy to introduce um, Dr. Samantha Sem Um Dr. Samantha Siempalapitia is a senior lecturer and program director of the Master of Speech Language Pathology at Griffith University Australia. She leads a program of research which aims to improve the provi provision of culturally responsive healthcare, in particular for adults with acquired communication disorders such as aphasia. So I'm really looking forward to this talk titled Supporting Bilingual People with Aphasia in Their Rehabilitation Journey, Where Are We Now? And just on a personal note, I know Sam for, um, for more than five to six years. So um, she's a colleague, but also a good friend. So I know how passionately um, Sam thinks about these issues and how her research is really, really moving in the direction that is useful for clinical practice. Um, so I emphasize that because, uh, because it's so relevant for uh, clinicians and she's one of those few, very few researchers who really thinks um, out of box. So I'm really excited to, to welcome you, Sam. Um, just to remind you, if you have any questions, please uh, post in the question and answer box and your comments are in the chat box. Uh, feel free to do that while um, um, Sam is talking. Thank you and uh, over to you, Sam. Thank you, Vishnu. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm just going to share my slides now and hopefully this will all work really well. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, welcome everyone. I was keeping an eye on the participant list and it looks like I'm still primarily speaking to people in the UK, so good morning to you. <laughs> um, it is actually 6 p.m. here in Australia, so um, I did see a maybe one or two Australian names that I recognize. Um, so thank you for, for joining at this um, somewhat late hour. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak um, at your centre. Um, I'm always very happy to speak to anyone about this topic that I'm very um, passionate about. So the title um, will become clearer as I explain 
who I am as a researcher and, and what stem um, what led to this line of research, but it's something that I've been thinking about for a very long time. Before I go any further, I'd like to, giving, as I'm giving this talk from Australia, I'd like to do the acknowledgement of country. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm delivering this talk. And so for, for me today, that is the Yagara and Turbul peoples. Um, I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, so what I'm going to attempt to do today, I was just saying to Vishnu and Holly before that I think I was a bit optimistic with my abstract, but I'll, I'll give it a good shot anyway. Um, so I'm going to tell you about my position, what I do, and my positionality as a researcher. And you'll see that what I do is very closely aligned to who I am as a person and my experiences that I have had. I'm going to talk to you about the catalyst for my research that's exploring bilingual aphasia. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the, the research that we're doing to try and uh, I'll, I'll talk about the gap in the literature and then talk about some of the research that we're trying to do to look at this issue. So this is the building that I work in, which looks really good, but I'm down on level two, so it's far less impressive where my office is. Um, but I was born at this top pin in Townsville, Northern Australia. This is Radical Bay. Uh, Magnetic Island, and this is Paluma Rainforest, which is very near Townsville. <clears throat> I currently work at the Gold Coast. I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Social Work and Health Sciences, and I'm the program director for the Master of Speech Pathology. So in terms of where I'm coming from as a researcher, I'm a second generation migrant. So you can see on that map, um, you can actually see Sri Lanka and Australia. So I'm definitely a product of colonization. <laughs> My parents came from Sri Lanka, which was colonized by the Dutch, the Portuguese, the British, and I live in a country that has a brutal history of colonization actually. Um, so, so I come from two different cultural backgrounds. And so there's a few things that, that this has led to. So firstly, in the bottom there, I, I've grown up in a, bi well, I grew up in a bilingual household and then have added a few languages along the way. And I, you know, I was always fascinated by language and that's my name, some of us in Malapitiya in the Sinhala script. So I, I asked my mum to teach me that language when I was a kid because, well, it's beautiful. And I just wanted to have that connection. And um, it also occurred to me that my mum was speaking in two languages at one point. And that actually is very close to what I ended up doing as a PhD. Um, I describe myself as an intercultural navigator because I, you know, in my home life as a, as a kid, I was, you know, eating rice and curry with my hands and um, being taught very Sri Lankan values and having expectations around one, how one should behave. Uh, and then, which sort of changed as we got older and started to rebel and started to acculturate. Um, but going to school and going to, you know, society and, and dealing with very different issues and sometimes not always having knowing how to deal with that. So I've spent my whole life trying to move between very different environments. And, and I think even now as, an, as a teaching research academic, sometimes trying to bridge and actually clinical world as well, trying to, to um, create a bridge between those different worlds. So yes, intercultural navigator. I put the brown hands emoji. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I had white Barbie dolls, white Cabbage Patch Kid dolls. The Band-Aids were for white skin. Um, there was no makeup for white, for brown skin as I got older. I grew up in a very regional area of Australia where it was definitely, at one stage I was the only brown girl in my whole high school with hundreds of kids there. Um, I'm very conscious of this sometimes, uh, particularly in the profession of speech pathology, which is very much lacking in diversity in a number of different ways. Um, but also, yeah, I, I, when I'm watching Sri Lankan teledramas to preserve my Singhala, I note that they advertise skin whitening creams, which absolutely infuriates me. So, so we, I feel that I need to advocate for the beauty of brown skin. And also, you know, why would anyone want to get rid of brown skin? It's like the best um, preservative in terms of your ageing process. Like, it's so good to have melanin. Uh, I just don't get it. But... Um, yeah, so that's really important to me. Another very important experience that has informed me as a person and a researcher is that I was a carer for my dad. So he had Parkinson's disease for 22 years and he was I was 13 when he was diagnosed. 
So there's no doubt that that has absolutely affected who I am as a researcher. I'm also a Buddhist. So even though I went to um, school and heard religious instruction classes that told us stories from the Bible, which were very interesting, um, but at home we were being taught how to meditate and we were taught about Buddhist teachings. And it's interesting as an academic trying to navigate the world of academia and maintain your Buddhist values. Sometimes that's quite a challenge, but um, that's definitely my priority. So all of this combined, the intersection of it all, as a researcher, I would say I'm a very pragmatic researcher. I think um, I'm very much aware that, you know, sometimes we don't have a lot of time. I think I've probably got, if I live to be that old, I've got another 20 years maybe. And, and there are some big problems that we want to solve. And so I, I try to take a very problem solving practical approach to my research. Um, I read the book by Adam Grant last year called Originals, and he describes the tempered radical. And I think this describes my approach to activism. So I'm trying to change certain things in our profession, in our research, um, but I'm also aware that sometimes people don't know what they don't know and that it's important not to shut down conversations. It's important to create spaces in which people feel they can actually move towards change. So, yeah, I describe, I really resonated with that term tempered radical. So this is who I am as a researcher. Um, to give you some context about Australia, for those of you who may not know, Australia has a very linguistically diverse environment. So first and foremost, there were hundreds of languages spoken by the First Peoples of Australia. Unfortunately, many of those languages have died out now. Uh, people are trying to preserve some of the remaining languages, but the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of Australia are obviously a very important part of the Australian culture. We also have many migrants um, <clears throat> and many migrant um, populations and different languages spoken. So over 300 different languages, 26% of the population born overseas, one in five people speak a language other than English. And this informs, again, some of the complexity uh, of dealing with bilingual aphasia in the context of Australia. And Australia is a very large landmass too. So what happens in one end of the country may be very different to a different area of the country. And that has resourcing uh, implications and implications for how we solve these problems. So I'm going to shift now to talking about how I got started in this line of research. So as a third year speech pathology student, so this is about 20 years ago now, um, I was in a, I was assigned to work do a placement at a rehabilitation unit. And I was um, allocated a lady to work with who was a bilingual Greek English speaker. And um, I, I was fascinated by this. So, so she had you know, problems with both of her languages. It was a really good match actually, because I was really fascinated and trying to do my best to help this um, lady with her languages. I was learning about aphasia. I think I might have done the aphasia course at the same time. I was learning about psycholinguistics. It was, however, a very mono, how I would describe it is a monolingually focused curriculum uh, and very much focused on English. So I wasn't, there was very little guidance about what you do when you have a bilingual person with aphasia. And so this presented a challenge that uh, I, I couldn't really draw on what I was being taught at uni. Um, there was a biennial book fair at this university and I went to the biennial book fair and I found this book by Professor Lorraine Obler uh, about bilingualism across the lifespan. So I was trying to work out, I'm trying to apply it to this lady that I was working with. The facilitators in this situation were that I had a very empathetic and supportive clinical educator who was absolutely committed to trying to make this, um, you know, what the services that we provide culturally responsive. There was great family involvement in that the family had, you know, created word lists in the Greek alphabet. And I was very passionate about this. So I started basically learning a bit of Greek myself. I worked out that, oh, these, these letters in Greek are actually the mathematical symbols that we learnt in school. And I tried to do um, bilingual therapy to the extent that I could. Uh, I, I put that, the cross and the tick there because uh, 
the it was very confusing because the if I'm remembering correctly, the Greek word for yes is ne, and the Greek word for no was ohi, and it's pretty much the opposite in Sinhala. So no is na and yes is oh. So every time this lady was going ne ne ne, <laughs> and in my head I was like, uh, it was extremely confusing. Um, for those of you, I think there are some students here today, and for those of you that are at the start of your career, I just wanted to also say that you never know what events are going to lead to something important in your life. So for me, this was a really pivotal moment, and I had no idea at the time. So back in 2019, uh, I actually presented at Professor Obler's lab about the research that I'm doing, and I would never have known that at the time. But also, the CE at this placement was as um, Associate Professor Emerita um, Bronwyn Davidson. And she had became one of my most important career mentors. We wrote a paper together in 2015 about managing bilingual aphasia. And, and she's been a huge influence in, in supporting my research and is one of my collaborators. And one of the students at that placement was um, the now Dr. Tanya Rose. And she was also a third year speech pathology student at that placement. And she and I are, are now collaborating on a project relating to bilingual aphasia. So you just never know what lies ahead. Okay, so now you've got a good sense of who I am as a researcher, where I'm coming from. And now I'm going to give you a flying tour of some of the literature and also some of the research that we're doing. So the first thing, I guess, if you're not familiar with the aphasia research is to know that aphasia research is not representative of the global populations and there are large gaps in terms of bilingual aphasia. I think we can safely say that aphasia research is thriving internationally, but whether it's representative is a different question. So there's some great research being done for people who speak English, but I'm not so sure about others. So for example, this paper that was, there was a review conducted by Beveridge and Bach in 2011, and they were basically arguing that, well, the, the current existing literature is not representative of the speakers of you know, the world's languages, particularly in terms of number. So for example, 85% of aphasia treatment research published at that time was published in English and Western European languages and was relevant to those languages. So some of the, the world's most widely spoken languages only accounted for 0.5% of the aphasia literature. So if we think about Indian languages, if we think about Chinese, South America, Africa, there are huge, uh, vast portions that are not included in the research literature. Um, a very recent study, Nui et al. from the US, also highlighted this point that less than 30% of aphasia treatment studies were reporting race or ethnicity. And that perhaps this you know, affects the actual ecological validity of the aphasia research that we do have. And that, that um, you know, the people in those studies were not necessarily demographically representative of US stroke survivors. I would say that that's potentially the same situation in other regions of the world where we have lots of um, you know, multiculturalism or different populations living together, like Australia. So Chelsea Larkman is doing a PhD at the Aphasia CCRE in Australia. And she, this is a quote from her recent paper, which was looking at, you know, what happens when the therapist and the patient don't speak the same language when they have aphasia uh, and highlighted this compelling need for published literature on aphasia rehabilitation for culturally and linguistically diverse people with aphasia. Just as a quick side note, I will say that I really don't like the term culturally and linguistically diverse, even though I use it myself. It is used in government, um, in Australian government documentation. So if you want to reach that audience, if you want to reach the healthcare sector, sometimes you have to speak the language that people will um, recognise. But I don't like it because it's an umbrella term. It kind of lumps together a whole bunch of people that are actually very different. And sometimes people talk about cultural and linguistic diversity as a global concept. It's not a global concept, it's a, it's a relative concept. If you are in a society and there's a mainstream sort of dominant culture and then some of these other cultures are different to that, that's when we get cultural linguistic diversity. Um, the global population is just diverse inherently, like, you know, we all, there's 7,000 languages spoken. Um, and then the final finding that I'll share with you, and there's plenty of others, but this is a, a handful, but uh, there was a systematic review conducted by Ansel Saidi in 2014 that found only 15 studies that investigated treatment of bilingual aphasia. 
if for anyone familiar with the aphasia literature, there are hundreds of studies looking at monolingual speakers. So big gap that exists. In light of that gap, it's not surprising that clinicians will feel challenged because they don't, you know, there's a big gap and then how do you work with bilingual people with aphasia? So this is just a couple of surveys. The first one is an Australian survey um, by Miranda Rose and colleagues, which found that um, clinicians reported low knowledge and confidence for working with people with aphasia from CALD backgrounds. And the, the survey by Jose Centeno also highlighted this dissatisfaction with resources relevant to working with um, diverse populations. So big gap, another big gap is in the hospital setting, which is ironic because most people who have a stroke and end up with aphasia will start their journey in a hospital. So Catherine, Kath, Kathleen Milan is doing her um, doctoral research at La Trobe University with the aphasia CCRE and I'm one of her co-supervisors. She published, published a scoping review last year and she was looking at what literature actually exists that looks at um, cal stroke outcomes and in, in particular in the inpatient setting and couldn't find much of it. So this is the gap that I'm particularly interested in looking at in my research. Um, because this is where we have professional interpreters coming into play. There's a multidisciplinary team often. There's family, how are they interacting? Is it a culturally responsive environment? And I've put the number 17 there because there is the famous statistic that um, you know, it takes 17 years for research to translate into practice. So if it's taking 17 years, we already know that it takes a long time to change clinical practice. Well, then we need to be doing research in clinical settings so that we're actually um, addressing the issue, you know, and it'll help with that translation process. So what I'm trying to do today is to provide you with a synthesis and an overview of three studies that we've done that I think inform our understanding of bilingual aphasia rehabilitation. Um, one of these looks at acute transitional care for cold stroke survivors. So this is looking not just at people with aphasia, but what happens when someone's from a diverse background in terms of language and culture. The second study was looking at um, speech pathology and interpreter into professional practice. And then the third study has been looking at how we manage bilingual aphasia in a hospital and healthcare setting. Now, all of these studies are currently um, in analysis, so I can't actually give you the publications. The first one, some of that data has been published and that's the reference um, that is on that in the first box. Essentially, they're all qualitative studies I actually did a doctoral, I did my PhD research using quantitative quasi-experimental methods, um, sort of more psycholinguistic methods. And essentially after my PhD, I wanted to do things that looked at what's happening in clinical practice in real world settings. And I realized that it's, it's very hard to set up research when we don't understand what's currently happening. We don't understand current practice and um, we don't understand it in that context. So I shifted to qualitative research because qualitative research is very good at describing phenomena of interest in their natural context. And so these three studies, although they have distinct aims, essentially they're all sort of trying to describe current practice in relation to these areas and also to describe the challenges and facilitators relevant to these different areas. So I'm going to be talking about these aspects. To put this into context, we know that aphasia is most commonly caused by a stroke. Okay, and, and I talked before about how, well, most people with a, who have aphasia will start their journey in hospital. So they're typically, and th this is what may happen in, in Australia, and I would uh, hazard a guess that it's similar in the UK, and from the brief documentation that I looked at, I think it is similar. I, I'm happy for anyone to tell me in, you know, if there's question time, if it is in fact quite distinctly different. In Australia, it will look something like this, the care pathway for a person who has a stroke. There might be differences depending on which region of Australia you're in and whether you're in a metropolitan or rural or regional or remote. But essentially the sudden onset of stroke, the person may present to an emergency department. If they are in that local region, they'll be admitted to the stroke unit.
then a period of rehabilitation, either it could be inpatient and outpatient, and then they live with aphasia, ultimately living with aphasia in the community. So I'm trying to synthesize some findings at three, three main points. Identification and diagnosis of bilingual aphasia or just people with, who come from these culturally diverse backgrounds. Then talk about working with interpreters and then managing bilingual aphasia. So this is my very ambitious aim. <laughs> See how I go. Um, in terms of identification and diagnosis, I guess the two things I'd like us to think about as clinicians in particular is how well do we know our caseloads in terms of cultural and linguistic diversity? Because that involves good data collection. So do we actually know who we're treating, where they come from, what languages do they speak? And when there is language difference or cultural difference, do we provide usual care? So I think these are important questions to consider. And in that first study that I mentioned, we did a 12 month retrospective review at a metropolitan hospital. And this is some of the data that we found. So there were 250 stroke admissions over 12 months. 34% of that caseload were culturally and linguistically diverse. 20% of these people were born overseas and spoke a language other than English. 35% of people who were from a diverse background were diagnosed with an acquired communication disorder. And 46% 40 of those with an acquired communication disorder had aphasia. So essentially this starts to give more of a sense of what the complexity is, but we didn't have access to this sort of data until we did the study and actually extracted this information and got a better understanding of what the caseload was. There were also, in terms of the people who had aphasia, there were 12 different countries of birth for those people and eight different languages other than English were spoken, which gives us a bit of a hint in terms of resourcing and how we might um, address some of those issues. So, and the complexity of addressing the resources too. Okay, so, so one of the first recommendations I have is that we ensure clear and accurate documentation about cultural and language variables. So for example, in this study, in the context that we were doing this study, the Queensland government, the state government has a minimum mandatory indicator. In other words, every, um, anyone who's from a culturally diverse, or we should be collecting regularly um, and compulsorily the preferred language of people. And, and however, this, this was not occurring. In this chart audit, we saw that this was not documented for 52 individuals born overseas. It was not documented for 19 people from non-English speaking and or multilingual countries. So there are implications of that. But the language information may have been documented in other ways. So native language, primary language spoken at home, other languages, or by saying ESL or non-English speaking background. The point is that it was inconsistent. So you have to go hunting for that information and it's not being reported in a consistent way. And there was one person for whom nothing was um, actually captured using any of those descriptors. So some more data from this study was usual care provided. So for example, if I, I'm gonna give you three case examples. There was a person born in India whose preferred language was English, recorded as English. The note said expressive aphasia resolved, discharged home. There was no referral to speech pathology. So while the doctors might have decided that the expressive aphasia had resolved, I think it would have been a good idea to refer this person to speech pathology, at least for a language screen. There was a person born in the Philippines who spoke Filipino. Um, the medical notes stated that they were proficient in English, but there were also noted lots of difficulties during the admission process. So potentially there is uh, you know, a language barrier, a language issue, maybe there's an aphasia. This person was not seen by speech pathology. There was a person born in Croatia who had under other languages, English, Italian, Russian, um, their first language and preferred language and primary language were not documented. And so we don't know which one is the primary language or we don't have that sense. The patient scored below average on the language screen and their language skills were not investigated further. So this raises the question, is this usual care? Is this something, uh, are we doing the same that we would for people who speak English as their only language? And this is not a criticism in any way of the site. I think if we were to look at many sites in Australia, we would find similar data. And I think it's, it's, not, it's because of the complexity of what we're dealing with, lack of resources, lack of understanding and systems that are not designed for bilingual people with aphasia. Okay. 
this is some, some quotes from the qualitative study, the third study that I mentioned, looking at bilingual aphasia in a hospital setting. And again, highlights this point that, you know, the, the participants who were speech pathologists themselves said that speech pathologists play a big role in identifying the difference between bilingual, multilingual and non-English speaking. And um, they also said that because in people with aphasia, so this point that when someone has aphasia, it can actually mask the fact that they once spoke English and it's the aphasia that has led to the language barrier, the language difference, the language change. It's not actually because they never spoke English in the first place. So speech pathologists play a key role in this process of clarifying what's actually going on. Um, this, so these chart audit findings have been briefly reported in this published abstract from a presentation that we gave at the International Aphasia Re Rehabilitation Conference a few years back. And so there's my clinical recommendation from this work is that we have clear, consistent and accurate collection and reporting of CAL variables to facilitate timely referral to speech pathology and delivery of the appropriate healthcare. Uh, I think, you know, even in terms of um, large data collection, you know, like national audits of stroke data, I don't know that we're collecting all of the right variables that we need to be collecting. These are obviously Australian findings and I'd be interested to know whether you think it might be similar in the UK or whether things are being done differently here. Um, as a, so now I'm going to shift to talking about interpreters and just to give you a little bit of background, these are some findings, the key, key challenges and strategies that speech pathologists um, and interpreters may uh, encounter when they're working together to manage people who have acquired communication disorders. This comes from a systematic review that was completed by um, Anne Huang and published in 2019. So you can see that, that there are a number of challenges like not being sure about the accuracy of the interpretations, not having clear role expectations, access, time, being you know, resources that are limited. And the two big um, strategies were reported in the literature were pre-session briefings and training. At the time of um, publishing this literature review, no one, there were, I think speech pathologists had been surveyed but there was a real gap in terms of finding out more about the, the actual interaction between these two groups. And so we did a study where we interviewed speech pathologists about working with professional interpreters. And we've also done the parallel interviews talking to interpreters about working with speech pathologists with this um, particular population of adults who have acquired neurological disorders. So we found three higher order categories that influence this interprofessional practice, place, people, and process. Place, um, under the higher order category of place, we have the category of context. Under people, we have language factors, education and experience, interpreter factors and relationships. And under process, we have logistics and clinical processes. Um, so this already starts to indicate that there's a lot of things that actually influence the interprofessional relationship. So in terms of place, just to, so these, these findings are very detailed and we're currently in the process, I'm writing the results and trying to analyze this data for write up. Um, but just to give you a feel of the kinds of challenges and facilitators that just to give you some examples, for example, with place, the context, an example of this, if, if people are in a rural setting, then often they don't have the same availability in terms of interpreters. So they may have access to phone interpreters, but not interpreters face-to-face. -face. Um, in a metropolitan setting, this is an example of a quote where um, the person in a metropolitan, the clinician in a metropolitan setting felt much more supported in terms of using interpreters. These are the factors that were found to influence um, the higher order category of people. So a number of different things. And again, just to give you an example or a taste of what this might look like, one of the barriers in terms of interpreter factors was that for interpreters, working with speech pathology is actually outside their usual scope because interpreters are normally required to get the message from person A to person B. Speech pathologists start saying to them, oh, what, what was that? Was that an error? Did they make a mistake? What kind of error was it? Was it, a, did, was it a semantic error? Was it a phonological error? What's actually going on here? So we're actually asking interpreters to step outside the bounds of what they would normally do and what their scope of practice says they should be doing. And that's what this quote illustrates. 
In terms of a facilitator, you, you get in particular interpreters because of their experience and their background, they understand what the patient actually needs. So this quote says, I have one interpreter who's really good at understanding the patient's needs and will break it down and use very few words, will automatically lengthen, go slow, and just adopt those kind of strategies that really help the patient. Then the, the final higher order category was process. So in the um, category of clinical processes, again, just to illustrate it, the interpreter, a challenge may be when the interpreter gives additional cues or prompts and the speech pathologist doesn't want them to. Because it's an assessment, they just want to hear what the person that with aphasia does when they're doing this task, but the interpreter steps in and tries to help. Um, so this interferes with what would normally happen in the assessment process. And similarly, a, a facilitator is that it can be easier to do therapy when you get the same interpreter. So because the, the interpreter has attended before, they understand the therapy tasks, they ask questions, they give good feedback. Um, and so this facilitates this whole process of speech pathologists and interpreters working together. So again, this is just to give you a taste of the findings that were very rich, but starts to give us a sense of the kind of things we need to be amplifying in terms of facilitators and the kinds of things we need to be trying to address in terms of barriers. We won't be able to address all of them, but we at least know where to direct our energies if we do, if we find out more about these kinds of issues. I wanted to share one, we, we are in the process of analysing the interpreter interviews, but I really wanted to share this, this quote for any clinicians who are out there, um, because I think it's such a beautiful quote. And when we we're doing the analysis, it really jumped out at me because this interpreter said, I think the pace in these rehab places, the proximity of all those professionals makes for a more cheerful environment. There's lots of camaraderie with the patients and you'll have different patients milling around and different physios, occupational therapists, speech pathologists, and everyone milling around. And it's a bit more like a village. Whereas those acute departments, they're more like a busy city center where people don't have as much time. I'm not saying these are, more are not pleasant places to work, but the rehab place is a bit more zen, a little bit more zen. So I love this quote. And to me, what it illustrates is that interpreters are a powerful source of knowledge, right? They're going in, interpreters don't always just work in healthcare settings, they're going to lots of different settings. But an interpreter like this is observing what's happening. They're seeing what's going on and they probably have really valuable information for us to tap into as well. And I think it emphasised one of the things that I've learned from this research is that we really need to see the interpreter more as part of the team. They sort of, because of the, the challenges in accessing interpreters, and sometimes they're, they're contracted in to work at a particular site, that might be better in larger metropolitan hospitals, but they're sometimes on the periphery or they're sort of added on and not necessarily as much a part of the team as they could or should be. So I'm now going to move to my final study, which was the one that's looking at bilingual aphasia in the hospital setting and how are we managing it? We had three questions in this study and I'm just focusing on the findings in terms of the barriers and facilitators that influence how speech pathology services are delivered to by multilingual people with aphasia. So you can see here, these are essentially the categories in which there were both barriers and facilitators identified. So the interp interpreters, interpreters come up in every study that I do. They're a really, which highlights for me that they're a really um, important part of service delivery, but also it's very complex. There's lots of challenges that also arise. The other categories were resources, time, knowledge and education and family. COVID-19 due to the timing of this study came up as a, and it was the only category in which there were only barriers, no facilitators, not surprisingly. So these were the categories. And this next table illustrates in a bit more depth what, you know, what these actually look like if we're talking about what kinds of things fell under these categories. So for example, again, interpreters is a big one. Um, using a telephone interpreter was a barrier, but having face-to-face -face interpreters is obviously a facilitator. The other barriers in terms of interpreters were things like not having access to them. Um, the complexity that arises when you're trying to do assessment with an interpreter, 
understanding the nuances of communication because you're essentially often communicating through a third party, which is very different if you can communicate directly with the person with aphasia yourself and their family. Working with a multidisciplinary team was a challenge because often when there's someone who requires an interpreter, the whole team wants a piece of the interpreter. That, you know, so you, you're competing with the OT and the physio and the doctors and um, so the interpreter has to be booked and the, the patient might start the day feeling um, you know, more energetic and they're very fatigued by the afternoon. So there's a lot of challenges that arise in terms of interpreter usage within that multidisciplinary team context. Um, the other facilitators for interpreters, obviously funding um, the interpreter experiences and attributes, some of which I referred to earlier in the other study. And again, training about how to work with interpreters and pre and post debriefing sessions are useful. If you have a pre-briefing session, you can talk about what's actually, what your aims are as a speech pathologist. Tell them a little bit about um, you know, what is an acquired communication disorder? These are the kinds of errors we might expect to see. Of course, it's going to be more efficient if we can develop training that is more overarching rather than doing that on a person by person basis. Another category was time. So not surprisingly, clinicians said that it was time consuming, there were time pressures, clinical processes take longer, takes time to produce resources. In the acute setting, you are more time pressured. Um, and your key performance indicators don't reflect all of this non-direct time when you're working with a bilingual person with aphasia. Makes total sense. The facilitators in terms of time were if the speech pathologist shares the same language, that can save time. Bearing in mind that if you've got over 300 languages spoken in Australia, you're never going to have a speech pathologist that speaks the language of every patient that they work with. So that will only go so far. Um, and also that this finding that more time is available in outpatient than acute. Resources, not surprisingly, clinicians were reporting a lack of education handouts and translations, uh, a lack of culturally appropriate resources. Uh, Google Translate was noted as a facilitator and having staff who speak the patient's language. One thing I would caution there though, is it ties to that point about time and workload are we factoring in staff who speak the patient's language and does this actually count on their workload? Are we noting the extra time that they're giving to that process of informal interpretation? Knowledge, education and training. Again, this is a finding that commonly comes up in my research is that we are not providing enough education about bilingual aphasia when people are at university. And so speech pathologists were then reporting that it takes extra time at the beginning of your career because you're trying to learn about how to do this. A facilitator is understanding the patient's culture. Family was another one in which they're very much a facilitator. The, the one um, barrier that has been reported so far is this mismatch between the interpreter and the family perspectives. So sometimes that may lead to complications or issues, um, but very much clinicians were saying that families help and they add value and that they provide really important information. For example, what was this person's communication like before they had a stroke and before they were diagnosed with bilingual aphasia? Um, COVID-19, not surprisingly, because of those limited visits from family and friends, it impacted on the informal interpretation that would otherwise occur and also impacted on the, the patient's mood and social connection. So that's a bit of a flying tour of some of the barriers and facilitators we've identified. We also looked at how services are actually delivered and the perspectives of speech pathologists. So all of that will uh, end up in the paper that we are currently preparing. So um, I wanted to then just resynthesize these different things that I've, I've very briefly sort of given you the flying tour of. I said I was going to talk about three areas, identification and diagnosis, uh, working with interpreters and bilingual aphasia service delivery. So these things that I'm describing might sound really simple, but if you think about if every site were to do these things consistently, what a difference that might make to our service delivery for bilingual people with aphasia. So the first thing I think that we should be working towards is ensuring clear, consistent and accurate collection and reporting of CALD variables to facilitate timely referral to speech pathology and delivery of appropriate healthcare, as I said um, earlier in the talk. 
Working with interpreters, I think there's no doubt that we need systemic changes to increase access and funding to interpreters. And I mean by this that, you know, there's regional, and, and I think telehealth is something we should be exploring for regional and remote areas that don't have the same access in Australia. Um, there is definitely a discrepancy in Australia between what policies say. So often policies um, exist that make special accommodations for speech pathologists and mental health care professionals that they can use interpreters more than other professions because of that focus on communication. And yet when you talk to speech pathologists, they will often feel that there is a funding pressure and a, you know, there's a time pressure. And if they're working with a multidisciplinary team, they're trying to get access to that interpreter in competition with the rest of the team. So we need systemic changes. We also need better training for both interpreters and speech pathologists to better understand each other. So I kind of talked about that earlier. Um, we also need the pre-session briefings that I discussed to educate the interpreter about the specific speech pathology needs. And then in terms of bilingual aphasia, a bilingual aphasia service delivery, we need systemic changes to workload and resourcing. There's no use pretending. It's obviously gonna depend on the person, the particular bilingual person with aphasia. Maybe sometimes they only wanna work on one language or maybe they speak a language for which there are good resources existing, if it's a very common in a particular region, but essentially it's going to take longer. Um, and so we need to acknowledge this in our workload models. If we're actually interested in providing equitable evidence-based evidence inclusionary care, we need to acknowledge that extra time. We need to be advocating for that. Family-centered practice is essential, and we need clearly more education and training for speech pathology students and the workforce. My final thing that I'm gonna talk about is that as I said at the beginning, I'm very pragmatic in understanding that we don't have a lot of time. I'm gonna do what I can for the remainder of my research career. And then we'll probably at that point still have a huge gap. So I'm trying now to do things that can be, while trying to do the research, which takes a very long time, huge amount of time, the ethics are complicated. It's hard to get other people to understand. You have to find the right reviewers. The, the research itself is complicated. The analysis is complicated. It takes a long time. Um, but while I'm doing that, I'm also trying to do things that will help now, here and now. So, for example, when I teach speech pathology students about bilingual aphasia, um, I have, you know, these days, speech pathologists, uh, we have to teach them more and more and more. The curriculum gets more and more full every year. And so I have three hours <laughs> to teach my students. I teach them about aphasia more generally, but I have three hours to really hammer home some key points about bilingual aphasia. So I have developed a method where I use a flipped classroom where I assign students, groups of students to different resources and readings. And then we use a case about a bilingual person with aphasia to work through that case. And you know, the, the students who have read about particular resources contribute at key points. Um, and you know, it's a blended learning curriculum. So using that approach um, means that you're simulating that process of clinical reasoning for when you work with a bilingual person with aphasia, which is much more like what happens in the real world. Every bilingual person with aphasia is different. Every case of aphasia is different. So when you throw bilingualism into that, it makes it even more complex. So that's been my solution for how I cover something that's very complex in a short amount of time. We're also developing bilingual aphasia resources. So uh, we did start, we've done this for three years. Um, students volunteer over the summer. We actually created a research project around this too, where we interviewed clinicians at workplaces about what, what resources would you like translated into other languages? And they said things like semantic feature analysis worksheets, picture banks um, with translations of the words and uh, information sheet explaining what bilingual aphasia is. So I've been working with the students to develop these. And at some point when uh, the, the magical gift of time comes together, we will make these uh, more widely available. Um, so they're not, you know, they haven't gone through any kind of rigorous pro process. Uh, I have the most recent thing I've done is uh, made a connection with the creative arts, arts students at our uni, and they're hopefully going to make the resources nice and pretty. They're, they're basic print and you know, hard copy resources, paper, you know, PDF things, but I think this is what the clinicians said they would find useful. So we're doing that. We've started a national special interest group um, looking at cross-cultural practice and acquired communication disorders for speech pathologists to share cases um, and work through those together to problem solve what we do in this you know, complex situation where we don't have a lot of research to support us. We don't have a lot of resources 
What can we do to improve our practice? And I've also started a culturally responsive community of practice, which um, Vishnu Co leads with me. And the idea here is more to harness um, expertise. So this is uh, really for, we've been trying to focus on people who either have active clinical research professional experience relating to culturally responsive practice. And we have four meetings a year and we um, you know, discuss our research, people present about their research. We have a team site where we share information. And my idea there is that we have to strengthen the foundation of the people who are trying to improve this area and sometimes are coming up against systems, um, academic and other systems that are not designed to support or understand this kind of research. So um, I hope I didn't bombard you with too much information. These are the references that I referred to. And if you have any queries or feedback about this presentation, please do email me. I'm always very happy to talk to anyone who has an interest um, in this area. So thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing my screen now. That was a that was a wonderful talk, Sam. Thank you so much. I mean, I, you know, normally my attention goes here and there, but this is like one talk that I just, you know, channel my attention and it was oh, good. really, really useful, practical clinical information, right? I mean, normally when you are in a talk, you are dealing with all these ecolinguistic models and then you're trying to make sense of how is it related to any real therapy and you know treatment but you really took the aphasia research uh, really relatable to clinicians so we're just still waiting for some questions to pour in so please feel free to use the question and answer. so we have one question from Ludo but before that can I ask a question maybe I won't get a, I won't get time to ask a question um so yeah so in terms of that preferred language you were mentioning earlier, do you mm. think sometimes because, you know, even if the person is not proficient, you know, quote unquote, in, in English, do you think mm. because of the system pressure, they just mention English and then that leads to all kinds of communication barrier? Yeah, that's a really interesting thing. I think um, recently something that I've been pondering is that I think sometimes we don't realize the impact of somebody coming from a background and then going into a system that they think is predominantly English speaking. So I think like sometimes people will say, oh, like even in terms of recruitment for studies, people will recruit and say primary language is English, or they'll say that, oh, the person only wants to work in English. But if you knew that your speech pathologist only speaks English, are you going to ask about the other language if you don't even feel that they understand bilingualism and how your other languages are actually important to you? And if you think the whole system, if you've navigated that for your whole life, if you, you know, like I said at the start of this talk, uh, well, I didn't actually say that, I, I didn't have time, um, but my parents spoke English to me, even though I grew up, they spoke to each other in Sinhala and we were very much encouraged for educational purposes because they thought this is what will make us successful um, to not speak Sinhala with them, to speak English. And so many bilinguals and migrants, you know, will be doing that. So, yeah, I hope I've answered your question, Vishnu. I, did I answer your original question? Yeah, I was, more, I was asking if the patient is feeling more pressured to, mm. by the system to just mention English as the preferred language, although, yeah, yeah that's, yeah. Yeah. So I think that, yeah, that's related to that point. I think when we're navigating systems and we're used to our whole lives kind of accommodating to what we think the mainstream right. is. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's a great quote by um, Michael Klein, who is an, a, a linguist, um, who says that Australia has a monolingual mindset. With a mouth, um, yeah. Yeah, multicultural yeah. country with a monolingual mindset. And it, it's such a great um, description because... We have all of these different ethnicities, but for many people, what that means is that they, you know, go and, and buy Vietnamese food for dinner, um, but they don't actually understand what it means to be bicultural or um, bilingual and how different languages are actually important. Like, you know, the, that for some people, and, and I hear all sorts of things about bilingualism that I think are interesting. Like, you know, you hear it described as a superpower. And I personally don't think it's a superpower. <laughs> It's, it's um, about exposure. It's about what has happened to you in your life as to whether you become bilingual or not. And that's kind of, again, that's a monolingual mindset. And I think so much of our thinking is monolingual. I was trained by a monolingual, monolingually focused curriculum, as I described it. I'm trying to change my own thinking. Mm 
-hmm. even though I grew up in a bilingual household and I learned other languages, bits and pieces subsequently, but it's, we're so conditioned. So yeah, absolutely. I think patients who are navigating that system will similarly, yeah. Yeah, feel pressure, yeah. I mean, yeah, Michael client stock can be applied to UK, US, you know, all kinds of situations. Yes. And especially for someone from a South Asian background, yeah. I mean, English yeah. is already in the milieu. So even if their parents are not really an English speaker, they they kind of like indicate that. So there's other kinds of issues going on there. So I've yes. got a question from Ludo here. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, Sam, for this very useful talk. If an SLT who does not know much about bilingualism approached you with one thing they should start from, what would you say? Oh, that's a good question. If they don't know much about bilingualism. So in very practical terms for bilingual aphasia, very practical terms, the, the review paper that I mentioned um, that I wrote with Bronwyn Davidson in 2015, which is available on ResearchGate, is something that I wrote for the Journal of Clinical Practice and Speech Language Pathology. And the last page of that journal article has all these lists of recommendations for what you can do if you're working with a bilingual person with aphasia. And it kind of reviews some of the key concepts. As a practical recommendation, I would do that if it was if they were specifically interested in bilingual aphasia. Um, Beyond that, someone who does not know much about bilingualism, where would you start from? If it was in our Australian context, I'd tell them to come to the special interest group <laughs> um, because they'll definitely pick up on, on some of the issues that we're talking about. But, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know beyond that where I would tell them to start. I'd probably start by doing that. I usually give people resources if they, if they have no idea where to begin. So. I hope that helped. Um, well, that <laughs> okay, I don't see any other questions. Um, so we have like three minutes left. So if you have any question, feel free to use the chat box or even the Q&A box. Um, so in the meantime, I have one more question. Oh, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a question here. So let me right. just, in the chat, yeah. Because you know, it takes some time for people to kind of like ask, and then you have lots of questions. So, yes. Is the SIG so, exclusively for Australian nationals or open more globally? No, I'm part of it, I guess. No. <laughs> no, that's the, that's the that's community. The other one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. At the moment, um, Annalisa, we have made it's still Australian. The main reason being because people are sharing their cases. So, they're, what we're doing is asking them to present a case of a person that they worked with. So we've actually said no students at this stage and the students are welcome to join once they join the profession because there's that confidentiality issue. The other logistical issue I think would be time zone. Australia's like in the worst place when it comes to time zone. So as Vishnu knows, when we try to host a community and practice meeting, we can never get US or you, um, Australia and Europe at the same time. So we have to have different times of day. It's just, it. so I think that would be another practical um, issue that we would face. Um, and then Louise had a question. Question? Yeah, please type your question, Louise, in the, in the chat box. So in the community of um, the practice, do you have um, clinicians coming and explaining very unique cases to you, Sam? So the, the special interest group. Um, yeah, the special interest, is, yeah. Yeah, so the special interest group, yeah, exactly. We've only, we've had, it's very new. We've only had two meetings, but um, the first one we had two clinicians, one from very regional area of Australia, one from a metropolitan hospital talking about cases they'd worked with. The last one we had a clinician presenting about working with code switching. Um, yeah, so that's the aim. We, we're asking, inviting people to present their cases and then we talk, we you know have breakout groups and share resources and mm. etc. So Louise's question is, my friend is a speech language therapist and English is not her first language, but she was trained in English and has done so much therapy in English that she no longer feels comfortable diving, um, doing therapy in her own language. What advice would you give? Yeah, so my advice about that, in terms of if you're saying she doesn't feel proficient enough, I think we have to look at this in terms of an equity and inclusivity aspect. So the way I explain this to my students is I say, well, 
what's better, not providing any services at all or providing some services? And I think if she has the capacity to speak that language to some extent, then I would be using that in whatever way possible. The other thing that I would say is that, you know, really with a lot of people with aphasia, there's language breakdown. So if they have an, ex, you know, they have an expressive aphasia and they're anomic, um, they can't name, then she may actually have enough proficiency to support that person in their learning. And yeah, I, to me, I think it's much better to do something than to do nothing at all. And I've worked with people who, yeah, speak when I was learning Italian, you know, Italian English speaker. And as I said, I leapt in and started trying to learn a bit of Greek and then um, a Spanish French speaker. So admittedly, so far just romance languages, but um, that's that's my advice. Yeah. Um, in terms of doing that. And probably think beyond oral communication because communication is not just yes. English, right? I mean, that's what yes. we do. So yeah, exactly. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Sam. It's 10. You're, you're really good with time. And thank you, everybody, <laughs> for attending. Um, so, yeah, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Sam directly or even contact me. Thank you. Grazie, Ludovica. <laughs> Prego. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Does it stop recording, Vishnu, or do we have to do No, something? I'm just going to end it, you know. I was just like waiting for the thanks to come in and then end it. Okay. Oh, I wonder.